Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm so excited to be here together today with all of you. My name is Katie Hazard, and I have the great honor of being the Associate Director of Art Management for Burning Man, and so I run the art department, which is the best job ever, really. I count my lucky stars every day. Uh, so um, here we go. We're here. Art Speaks, first one ever. I want to invite you all to use the chat. I see some folks are already doing that. Please feel free to chime in, say hello, say where you're calling in from. Um, and then if you have questions as we go, you can see that there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So we'll have time for sort of live Q&A with the artists at the end of this event. And so please put your questions in that Q&A box. Um, okay, so, so what is Art Speaks? Like what is this thing and what's it all about? A couple years ago on Playa, one of our incredible volunteers, John Valentino, who I saw is here with us together today, came to me and said, I want to do this um, artist talk series on Playa. And so we've done that for a number of years and it's been wildly successful. The artery is just packed out the door with people coming for that. And so in this year, in the time when we have the opportunity to do things virtually and invite folks from all over the world, we thought, why not take this um, into everybody's homes and do it virtually? So. You know, in this role, I help more than 400 art installations come to Playa every year. And you wouldn't believe the, the adventures and the stories I hear from people that are bringing their projects. And so, and I'm sure you yourself, you've seen either in person or images of art from Burning Man and wondered like, what the heck, like how did that thing even come to life? And at Burning Man, we celebrate the process as much as the product. And so that means we're really interested in the lessons learned, the communities that have formed, the skills that are built, the failures, the triumphs, all of that stuff like on your way to actually having this artwork come to life. So we wanted to have a chance to let these artists share their experiences with you. So today, the first Art Speaks, what's the program gonna be like? Um, well, this today we have three grant funded honoraria artists that are here live with us. So the way the timing worked, we had already selected this year's honoraria artists before the pandemic hit. So a lot of these artists, while disappointed they're not bringing their work this year, are actually kind of grateful that they have all this extra time to begin building. Some of them are able to safely still be building during this time. So those are the three of the artists that are coming today are in that boat. Um, so lucky for us, we're going to get a little sneak peek into what they're up to. So each of these three artists that are here with us live will share a short video, about five minutes each. And then after that part wraps up, we'll move into the live Q&A part. And one more reminder, Burning Man is all about participation. You know, we have our saying that there are no spectators. So as you listen to these artists' stories, remember that you too can be involved. You know, everybody is welcome to bring art to Burning Man. We don't commission any of the artists. If you are an artist listening today, we'd love to get your story and feature you someday. If you aren't yet an artist, um, maybe you will be someday and maybe uh, we'll be featuring you at some point in the future. So without further ado, um, I wanna get into it. It's so fun actually seeing where all the people are calling in from. That's cool. <laughs> um, so besides running the Burning Man Art Department, I am also a yoga teacher and a longtime meditator. And I wanted to start this very first Art Speaks Off with a, a very small ritual. Um, so in a lot of traditions, ringing a bell is a way that you begin something. It's, it kind of helps to, to clear the energy, to dispel anything, to clear any obstacles, and to, to help make good things come their way. So um, I went around my house and I picked out three different bells that I have, and I'm going to do one for each of the different artists. So if you'll uh, bear with me on this part. So for our first artist, I have selected a Tibetan bowl that belongs to my husband. Um, it's from Nepal. A friend brought it back from him. So I'm just going to ring this before our first artist, Usha, speaks. And you'll see in a moment why I chose a bowl for Usha. So Usha Sijaram, she is joining us live all the way from South Africa, which is so cool. She is an internationally renowned artist and she's best known for her translation of everyday ordinary objects into art. So that's why I picked a bowl because I thought, okay, it's also an ordinary object of sorts. 
Uh, her work has a distinctly Dadaist influence, and she's completed numerous large-scale public art commissions, including a beaded portrait of Nelson Mandela that was used at his funeral. She's a prolific artist, having produced nine solo exhibitions, uh, participated in many group shows in South Africa and abroad. She holds a master's degree in fine art, and her work sits in various institutional collections. So welcome, Usha. I'm so excited to have you here with us today. Hi, Katie, and hello, everybody, all the way from Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm very excited to be here today and to share with you the process. We've had uh, numerous challenges and uh, the world is upside down right now, but I look forward to getting into it. Hi, I'm Usha Sijerum. Uh, this is my studio where I work every day. Um, when I was asked to make a work for Burning Man, I thought a lot about my practice uh, and the materials that I work with. And I work with uh, domestic objects like irons and pegs and brooms and mops. And the reason I work with these objects is because I like the fact that they're ordinary, that everyone can relate to them. And for me, these objects are quite uh, genderized, um, they uh, associated with the female. Uh, so when I was asked to make a work for Burning Man, I thought about the theme, the multiverse, and also the question that was posed in the, in the brief around uh, pataphysics, um, the idea behind an impossible solution or a solution to an impossible problem. And because I work with the wooden peg so much, I thought about the function of a peg and the function is to hold things together and the, if, you, if you strip away its function it becomes something quite impossible. So I decided to make half a peg. I then also decided to scale it up. Like what happens when you monumentalize uh, an ordinary object and so that's where the, the concept came from. Uh, in addition to making this impossible sculpture, I also decided to uh, make it out of uh, pipes. So essentially this object is made from negative shapes. We're making form out of unform. To make a work on this scale in conditions that are quite uh, unfamiliar to me, the heat, the wind, the, the temperatures. I've had to uh, surround myself with experts in, uh, in fields that are outside of my practice. So I've got an incredible team uh, working with me. The resurrection of the closed egg is just so exciting to be involved in. To be working with a genius like Usha Sijara, to be working with engineers of such quality who just enhance the artwork with every move. We've really been just so privileged to be a part of this team, to be able to do more than architecture, to turn architecture into art. For us, this is a dream. And this is Alma. Alma is one of the magicians slash architects involved in the incredible peg design. We've been helping Usha with all of the technical work. For us, the technical aspects are what bring the resurrection of the closed peg to life. You know, having to really, really engage with lighting on a real level, making sure that it's a safe structure, something that can be engaged with without burning the user. We, we looked at things like transport. How does this thing pack away into a container? Where does it go next? There's so many questions and so many solutions that we constantly had to come up with that made this project really, really, really special. Hello, people. I'm uh, Rodney from the MRH Consulting Engineers. We were the appointed engineers on this uh, incredible project. Most people just think of engineering as uh, being boring and all about maths. 
it is a bit about that, that when we have the opportunity to design an incredible artistic work such as this one, it allows us to push the boundaries of uh, design and to give people that wow factor by looking at how, in this particular case, what made it challenging is the uh, asymmetrical support which uh, results in eccentric loads having been transferred to the ground. And of course the overall goal is to make sure that everything is safe. We've had the opportunity to work with incredible artist Usha who brought this project to us and we've had to turn her dreams into a reality along with taking budgetary constraints into account to make it uh, still an affordable project. Here's one of the engineers, my colleague Jason, who's just walked in. Hi everybody. Hi Joe. Hi. So tell me, have you had opportunity to uh, check the design? Well, I've had to check it multiple times. As you can see, it is quite a complicated project. Um, I probably went over the design about four or five times to, to make sure all the designs do conform to, to our SANS regulations. And uh, yeah, it's stable. We, we managed to do it. Good. So uh, to all you people out there, when you see the peg in the ground, enjoy it and uh, it'll be safe. Hello fellow Berners, Ross Marco here from Open Air Engineering, working with the brilliant Usher on this unbelievable project of the resurrection of the peg. Unfortunately, we are unable to be joining everybody this year due to a worldwide pandemic. But we are so excited to bring this unbelievable project to life next year. Behind me, you can see all the parts that we are going to be using to manufacture this unbelievable art piece. A work of this nature and of this scale has so many players in the background. Uh, in addition to um, the team that I have working here in South Africa, there has also been support from uh, Nana Sao and the Sao Foundation uh, who have just been guiding this whole process. And I just want to acknowledge their support uh, in the production and in the initiation of this piece. Uh, countless people have also contributed uh, towards the, the funding of this work uh, and, and continue to do so as we are still fundraising for the work. Uh, and I'm also grateful to be uh, one of the honoraria artists. It's a big privilege to be part of the, the core of, of Burning Man. So this will be my first Burning Man experience. It's a, it's a year delayed, but maybe that just builds the anticipation even more. Um, and most exciting is that I will be the first artist from Africa to have um, shown an artwork at Burning Man. Um, right now, where the world is, uh, with Black Lives Matter, um, with questioning colonial uh, heritage, it's important that the, the African voice is represented and I feel honored to be the first artist and also the fact that I'm a female artist. And that's why I think in particular this work has special relevance and special meaning. It's important that this happens. Yeah, I just saw someone in the chat say, amen, sister, and I am totally down with that. Um, what a cool thing to see, Usha. So, like, to see all the way on the other side of the globe what you're up to, just the interior shop, like Peter in the chat mentioned. And what I thought was so cool is how so many of the crew in the video mentioned how honored they felt to work with um, a brilliant genius like Usha. And I just have to say that we at Burning Man Project also feel the same way. We're really excited to be welcoming her into our community of artists. Yes, applause. <laughs> I like the chat. It's fun to see. Um, okay, are you ready for my next bell? It's actually uh, it's more of a chime than a bell. It's uh, made in France and introduced to me by a Peruvian friend. So take a listen to this one. <laughs> I like how it's, um, it's kind of mystical and galactic, which is why I chose it for our next artist, uh, Ida Keshtar. Ida is joining us from Chicago. A little shout out to Chicago, my hometown. Um, Ida's been coming to Black Rock City since 2013, and she's very involved with her local Burners Without Borders chapter. 
her um, relatively small scale project that she brought in 2016 had such a huge impact. I mean, people just loved what she brought. It was a runaway success, a huge hit. It got so much love. So I'm really pleased that she's able to share more about her work with us today. So welcome, Ida. Glad to have you. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you all today and to be a part of this new virtual chapter with Burning Man. Hi, I'm Ida. Uh, I'm an artist in the Flatiron Arts Building in Chicago. We're about to go in and go to my studio and talk about Space Scouts. So let's go check it out. So Space Cats, the idea came to me back in 2016. Well, let me warn you, it's a very sad beginning. I put my cat down and I found myself paper mache a cat head. And that's when Captain Sargo was born. So that summer, I applied for my very first installation at Burning Man. I built three space cats, all based off real cats that have passed away. And that's when the Whimsical Project took off and they started traveling the universe. With the first edition of Space Cats, I didn't know the feedback that I would get from it. So we had a seven foot TNC cut rocket ship with 69 cat names engraved on it. And I remember on my way there thinking, oh man, I hope nobody tags it, it's all plywood. And it's funny because after day one of setting up, I went there and people wrote on it. And when I got closer, there were messages to their cats that passed away. And I found myself immediately at that moment on the playa crying because that's what Space Cats is about. It was about everyone releasing their, their pets through this project. So by the end of the week, the rocket ship was filled, filled, filled with messages. And my camp allowed me to bring back the rocket and put in the burn barrel and do a nice little official burn. When I first heard about Space Cats, I mean, I'm a cat owner myself and have been a lifetime cat owner. And so I did the idea of um, uh, shining a light on cats of the past, living and dead, and, and seeing how they af affect people is really great. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the Burning Man community embraces um, Space Cats as a whole. Two things I wish I did differently. Plan the car battery a lot better, and I wish I had a lightning technician who did who lit the whole project instead of just the cat helmets, and I wish I brought him on board with me. We're going back to the car battery is, I didn't really plan on how to charge it and how to turn it on and off. So I found myself biking to the installation from my camp to the trash vents every sunset, every sunrise to turn it on and off, on and off, because I didn't want to waste the battery. And it would last about two to three days. But then once after two to three days, at, right after sunrise, I would bike there with my little basket, put the heavy car battery in and bike back to camp. With the second version of the project the following year, we decided to go bigger. I, we went, we built a 22 foot rocket ship that you can climb in the center and you could see all of the playa from the trash vents. It was a beautiful view. But there was a lot more challenges that came with it. Sadly, a week before we left for Black Rock City, my partner had an emergency and had to dip. Next thing we know, me and my other co-lead, we were struggling. We were struggling to finish a project on time. We were struggling to leave on time. And when we were on site, we were struggling to build it. For this next iteration of Space Cats, we're coming back with more cats. More cats, bigger rockets, a space dog, and two space rats. We're really excited about the mothership. It's going to be a catagon shaped spaceship for you. It's going to have a tongue slide from the front and then a staircase can come in from the back. And when you come inside, it's essentially going to be a huge cat house, but for humans. Relationship with Space Cats started in 2017 when my friend Ida 
asked me to come in and help finish the project when she lost one of her builders to a family emergency. I'm, I'm excited about the challenge of building a large climbable structure that's also environmentally friendly and burnable, which uh, is just exciting from an engineering standpoint. Something that's really important to me always and to our, to our whole team is uh, being very environmentally friendly with everything. So I've saved a lot of like sort of space age looking trash and things at my warehouse and like it's all categorized into like silver and gold and not real silver and gold but like that color. Um, so we'll use all that and that way we're not um, you know creating more trash at the, at the end of everything. In the eyes of the attendees Space Cat 2.0 was a success, but in my eyes, I feel like I failed. I had a hard time getting over with how everything unfolded that year. Taking two years off since 2017, I was able to work on other projects and be more inspired and not burn myself out. And with the things, with the mistakes I did make, in the past few years, I'm hoping from what I learned from them, I will do a lot better with this final iteration of Space Cats. The way I see it is, I don't see as Burning Man getting canceled this year as a negative thing at all. I think, in fact, we can all benefit from taking a year off. We can all better ourselves as artists and as people all around. Oh my gosh, I love this so much. <laughs> I mean, I love cats, I love space, like cats in space is so next level. And um, clearly lots of other people are, are uh, captivated by this project. I can't believe I just did that. Um, and it's so important to have a pro place to process the loss of a beloved kitty or, um, or dog or rats this year. So I'm so excited to see this final iteration of the Space Cats series. And thank you so much, Ida. Uh, so now transitioning to our third uh, artist of the day, last but certainly not least, um, with a little drum roll, or um, in this case, rather than a drum roll, I have a cowbell. <laughs> yes, this is a, an honest to God cowbell that my parents got in the Swiss Alps in the 80s that once upon a time was on a cow wandering through the mountainside. So for these next artists, somehow this seems like the, the bell for them. Um, and you'll see why in a moment. So what we have next up, Michael Garlington and Natalia Bertotti. They have been collaborating and building art together since 2013. They brought the amazing photo chapel to Black Rock City that year that many of you know and a lot of other projects since. Uh, recently, they were commissioned by the Smithsonian Institution for the No Spectators, the Art of Burning Man exhibit to build this fantastical archway um, full of their, their typical style. So uh, did any of you have a chance to see that? Maybe chime in in the chat as that, um, that exhibit got to travel around the US a little bit. So we are so excited to have them here together with us today. And let's welcome Michael and Natalia. Hey Katie, thanks. Love the cowbell. <laughs> cowbell, perfect. <laughs> More cowbell. <laughs> More cowbell for sure. Um, I'm Natalia Bertotti. I'm Michael Garlington and welcome to the horror. And the wonder. <laughs> Video. Welcome to Bertottingham Forest. <laughs> We've started to build a, a, in this creek on our property a, a magical, fantastical land of photographic cutouts for a, a children's yeah, I, yeah, she loved it. <laughs> it's a win. Uh, we uh, babble for Burning Man, which is not happening this year. We were going to do a big city. Uh, of miniature cutouts around it. So this sort of represents the feeling of the sort of surrealistic world that we wanted to create. Where 
Where's Daddy? Ah. Hey, hey, Popsy. <laughs> so all of this is adobe from, we're on adobe road, and all this hill is made of adobe. So we took this and the grass and mixed it with the adobe as binder, and we're able to clad all the walls with mud, which is such a wonderful thing to do. Um, if you've never done it, I, I recommend it highly because it's like working in an ancient way. So what you see here is the family trailer. It's a, it's a guest house, and on it uh, are photographs of all of our family. You know, like some have come and gone, and uh, some of the matriarch and the mother and the father and the sisters and the brothers. Um, it's also in a 3D pop-out, which kind of represents uh, how, how Babel is going to be much more detailed and popped out with the photograph concept. So ceramics is something that I've been getting into and I'm so excited about this because we've started to be able to make decals uh, and fire them onto the ceramics making permanent photographic pieces. It's my dream to build a photo temple um, that's, that could be permanent, that could carry on the ethos of Burning Man, but could be permanent. You know, So right here you see it's just the beginning and then all the relief would be done by hand. Uh, and modular, which I love about these things, is that they all click in, and boom, you can move them, you can take them places, and then they become one. One thing of a bigger thing. So what we're seeing here is sort of the, the model of Babel, the wreck of what, what was the model of Babel, um, and around it will be a miniature city that you can find a million secrets and look uh, in nooks and crannies and it enter and exit uh, the piece. Uh, uh, within the middle, we'll have uh, the arch that was at the Smithsonian uh, be the centerpiece. So uh, we're going to modify it a bit and give it a lot of new mysteries. Wow, that was so cool. Bertottingham Forest. Oh my gosh, I really want to visit there. <laughs> what a beautiful space and beautiful family and beautiful work. So cool to see the new ceramic stuff you're working on. I love it. Um, great. Okay, so now we've had a nice little tour with each of the artists that we have here with us together today. And so now I want to invite all of the artists to bring your cameras back on and come back on screen. And we're going to have a good amount of time here for some live Q&A. So um, keep adding your questions into that Q&A box that you see there, and um, we'll go through a couple of them from here. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with a question for you, Usha. Uh, somebody asked, I see the art is being built in Africa. What's involved in bringing the piece to the playa? How much building or rebuilding will be required on site after it ships? Very also, good question. I, I know you have a, like more than a year until this is going to happen. So if you don't have it all planned out yet, that's okay. <laughs> it's a very good question. And it's been one of our biggest challenge, uh, challenges. This uh, thing of balancing cost, uh, cost of building in uh, South Africa, uh, shipping cost. And uh, what uh, has been quite a tricky thing is to build it in a way that requires minimal assembly but still fits into a, a container. So uh, uh, what of the, um, the engineers have done is to adapt the design quite significantly so that it does fit into a single container and then it'll be shipped. Uh, it's quite a long journey because uh, it gets shipped and then trucked and then, <laughs> um, yeah, it's got a long journey, but it is, it is a challenge and I think that we are on top of it. Um, yeah. That's really wonderful. Yeah, I'm impressed you have that much planned already at this point, but that's really what we always recommend to artists is to think about the transportation before you get to the part where you're, you're building and designing because um, it makes things a lot easier later down the road. That's great. Yeah, and we also want to make it as easy as possible on site uh, so that it's not a, a mission to having to assemble a lot of small parts. So we're essentially making the entire thing in th four 
three parts of the peg and uh, one part that has that supporting structure. Cool, that's great. Yeah, that's another thing we advise is to build at home and install on Playa so that you're not actually, you know, doing that much um, building once you get there because the conditions are quite difficult, you know, as you'll see, but that's great, thank you. Correct. Yeah, um, let's see, I, I have a question for you. Um, looking back at the past two iterations of Space Cats, how did you keep a sense of humor when things got intense? Uh, how did you keep things fun for you and your crew, or were you able to? I mean, the project itself is so fun, but but how does that work when you're in the intensity of, of that pressure? Um, what's that like for you? The first year was, there wasn't really that many intense moments, just really long bike rides, which were really fun because I would take a different route every time just to like ex experience more of Black Rock City and just see more different parts of the neighborhood. Um, the second year, things did get very intense, um, especially when we were building. We were in the trash fence and we didn't have shade building in the sun. And how we made it fun is by keep reminding ourselves that we're here, we're gonna get through it. And in the end of the day, it's not about us, it's about space cats and it's about people in the end still being able to interact with them. And throughout the week, people were give, have giving us positive feedback. So that helped us not think about our problems as much until we get back to Chicago. And then we can talk about it. Cool. You know, someone else just asked another question. Um, when did you know that Space Cats would be a multi-year project? Pretty much the first year I, I knew I was gonna come back the next year with a bigger rocket. Um, it wasn't until the end, the last day of 2017, when I looked at my bill, my co-lead and I was, and I looked at him and I said, I'm going to take two years off and then we're going to come back 2020 bigger, stronger than ever. So that's when, uh, when I knew it was going to happen. Cool. Yeah. It's fun to see pieces that are a series, you know, sometimes an artist will bring a piece and it doesn't exactly come the way they want to and they bring it again and do it the way they want. But your piece was so great the first year that it's been fun to watch it, uh, you know, humiliate or right and grow and get, you know, get even cooler year by year. So it's right. been fun and to the experience. Part is, it's because it's such a whimsical project that I have, whenever I do post about Space Cats, I post it as Captain Stargo and she's telling her story of her journey as a space cat. So, and then there's a whole universe that that she's built about Space Cats Planet and Yarn Galaxy. So I like that the story still goes beyond Black Rock City. That's fun. Where can we read more about the, the what did you call her, Stargo? Captain Stargo's Log. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, any, any social media posts. So I did okay. start an Instagram for Space Cats if anyone want to follow her. And okay, fun. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> um, Okay, Michael and Natalia, let me come up with a question for you. We've got a whole list of them here. Um, one that I'm curious about is that your work is such an interesting combination of two types of media, right? Photography along with um, sculpture or even architecture, you might say. How did it come to be that you put these two different media together? Did you start off with one and move into the other or, or tell us what that was like for you? I, you know, I started out working for my parents in a black and white photo lab as a teenager and um, stayed in a dark room for years and, and printed and learned my, learned my trade uh, to print, you know, emotionally. Um, went out and had shows, but always kind of wanted more, wanted more reaction, wanted more of a portal into the photo because I'd be putting so much into these intricate fantasy photographs that I wanted it to be like you could walk into it or get as close as you could. And so it started with frames that were really intricate. And um, then it became photo cars, you know, which became DPW uh, fluffer vans. Uh, <clears throat> so people could go and, and, and get closer and get a, a glimpse of themselves working on these vans. Uh, and then with the opportunity to be able to build a structure at Burning Man and, and have a massive large scale architectural gallery, which are portals into these photographs was such an incredible opportunity. So that, that's kind of how it, it went from, you know, just the 2D to more of a 3D concept. Yeah, and it totally adds to the story too, just like putting different animals with it and the plants. 
and just it's the best frame I think a picture could yeah. ask for just kind of it starts to dictate adding. itself you know you put a photo in there and then Natalia brings an idea and then it's just like yes yes oh my god and then like you we're just going places we we never thought we would go and um and that's just super exciting I mean that's what making art is about is to be in control but then to be out of control and that's like the most exciting because you stand back and you, this wasn't me. This was like something from the universe. This was cowbell. <laughs> Sometimes it just comes through that way. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. super cool. You know, someone else, Diablo um, here was asking about the peepholes in your pieces and you know, the dioramas and getting people in close. Like, do you have anything more to say about, about how those came about? um those came about just as more of an experience for people to like become part of the artwork because if you look in and you see your eyeball in the mirror so it's like the viewer is actually completing the piece and um yeah just to add another layer of depth that you get to go and see and explore and try and find in the artwork there's always more things to see we try to make it so that there's lots of different like secrets hidden everywhere so yeah it's true it's like and as we're building it it becomes like exciting for us to continue building like okay so we'll do a people here and all these pockets that could have been wasted space become like completely filled right and that just keeps it really exciting and fresh for us as well yeah i mean for us too right like you can spend so much time with one of your pieces just because you maybe think you've seen it and then there's another corner to come around and there's another whole something and um yeah or i like just the way you wait oh, totally. <laughs> i know oh. <laughs> it'll come <laughs> I'm, I'm getting chills here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're really excited about it. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, Usha, let me come back to you. Let's see what other people have asked. Um, so you are the first woman Africa, woman artist coming from Africa in um, to Black Rock City, and you're coming from such a long way to bring this art. And um, people are curious, what's inspired you to want to do this? Um, why, why Burning Man? Uh, well, there was a call, uh, which I responded to. A, a number of artists were invited to uh, propose an artwork for Burning Man. And uh, somebody also asked me if I've, uh, I've, not, I've not been to Africa Burn before, but I have uh, worked on numerous uh, large scale projects. I've had uh, the pleasure of completing a number of uh, commissioned public artworks. So I'm used to working on a large scale. And uh, so this appealed to me. Uh, so I responded to the call. Uh, I believe that a number of proposals were sent in and then they, they chose mine. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, I think it's just such a unique context that I'm uh, curious and I'm, uh, I'm tickled by the challenge. I don't know if I'll be saying the same thing when I'm there and there's like real challenges. I'll probably be crying, but uh, I'm excited. I'm excited about the whole culture of, of Burning Man because I've not been. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly say there probably will be a point when you cry. I would say almost everyone that comes to Burning Man, even if they've been going like 20 years like me, you still have a time when you cry. <laughs> but yeah, you come I'm out sure. of it and you're like, oh, that was the best thing ever. So yeah, I'm really excited to get to partner with you as you go through that. Yes, we'll cry together. Yes. Okay, great. That's a date. <laughs> uh, um, okay, Ida, let me see what questions have come in for you. Um, people are curious a little bit about um, your other work. Um, have you made other art before you started Space Cats? Uh, what's the journey yeah. like being um, a self-taught artist? So I actually do a lot of pop-ups around the city. Well, not obviously not right now, but I've done a lot of pop-ups in the city of Chicago, which has different themes. I do an annual Star Wars pop-up. I've done like um, just different themes. At least I've done eight of them around the city. Uh, if you can feel free to reach out. I do have some videos of the pop-ups if you want to know what the video is like. I have a web website with some of my other works on it. Uh, the journey of being a self-taught artist has been exhilarating and challenging at the same time. Uh, I've always wanted to go to school for art, but my parents were against it. So when I graduated, uh, I started doing my own thing because I did the thing they wanted me to, and now I can be my own person. And it takes a lot of motivation and a lot of will, but 
once you're on the other side and you've taught yourself something like a new skill, it feels really good and it's very rewarding in that sort of way. Cool. Yeah, I, I studied art history and I remember my parents being like, are you sure you don't want to take some business classes maybe? Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, and now I'm like, look, it paid off. <laughs> it <worked>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Well, fun. I'll look forward to looking for the other things that you've done. I mean, the space cats are so cool. It'll be ne neat to see, you know, what else. Um, okay, back to Michael and Natalia. Let's see. Uh, Okay, a couple really practical questions. Um, one is, how do you adhere the printed materials to your structures so that they last in extreme environments? So, you want you want to? Oh, no, you want Okay, well, we, <laughs> <laughs> we water down wood glue. So it's a watered down wood glue. And um, it's, with a lot of practice on the exact balance of water ratio, we found a way you saw during the video we had the family trailer that's all covered with the paper just like the totem and the to and photo chapel and that's been sitting there for two years through rain and shine so it, it really does breathe through the rain um, it gets wet and you could scratch it off but if you if you don't scratch it off it will be wet and then dry again again we covered a van which is metal with the paper, it's like bond. But the bond, yeah, the paper is key too, because it's like almost as thin as newspaper. So it totally mm -hmm. absorbs the water yeah. in glue. And then we go on the back side of the paper and over the top of it once we put it on. And that kind of protects it from the rain a little bit, maybe for a time. For a We've time, also yeah. tried putting a urethane on top of that. That doesn't work like- But the, it's like- yeah, yeah, when you do the resin on top, it looks great for, for one season, maybe out there, but the resin will, once the sun gets to it, it chips. And then the water gets behind the resin and then it's just over. But we found with this bond paper, just the bond paper, if you allow it to breathe through the rain and the sun, we get like a two year life cycle outside, which, which yeah. holds blacks and everything. It's amazing. It is. That's cool. Yeah, I'm sure you had to experiment a bit to get to that point, but two years on an outside trailer, that's a, uh, incredible. Yeah. Cool. A lot of crying. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cry with you guys too. <laughs> I wish we could see the actual ratio too, but it's all we kind of just feel. We're gonna one, we, of one of these days we're gonna have we'll a book measure it. everything. Is very scientific. Um, <laughs> people have a couple other practical questions for you guys too. Um, for a project like Babel, how do you plan to manage the line to explore the interior of the space? You know, we're eighty thousand people at Burning Man. Like everyone's gonna want to see this amazing thing. Do you have? I mean, I know it's a while off still, but have you had thoughts yeah. about that yet? So no, I mean, we watched with the totem because we didn't know how people were going to be going through this thing. So having a centerpiece in the middle of the room always helped because people tend, there's no rule, but they tend to move right and around left and come out to the left. So that, that's, as we watched last time, that really did work. And then uh, they, they usually, people will usually make their own lines you know, and so that people can see it and not feel too proud. This isn't always true. But what I started to notice is they would start dictating themselves to, you know, let only so many through. We weren't there telling them what to do. So that was really cool to see. Being a huge fan of Pirates of the Caribbean, I was always wanted to work behind the sets of Pirates of the Caribbean. So I got to actually see sort of a line and they're going into a dark place. It was a dream come true. So that's how I think we're going to do. With Babel, though, there's going to be some other places to explore. You can go inside and see the arch and all the secrets. But there's also a city that surrounds Babel, a miniature city. So as you are sitting at Center Camp or uh, the, the cafe and you look out at Babel, you're going to see this little glowing city. And as you get closer, you're going to realize that you're the giant within the city. And you can actually walk between the different houses. <clears throat> That's, so that'll sort of be on the outside. You're a giant walking through this miniature city, looking into the window of people doing their daily rituals. So, That's so cool. You know, somebody else wrote in about Babel. Um, are you thinking of building in little hideaway spaces? I've always had this dream of a giant game of hide and seek on the playa, and this feels like a perfect spot. So yeah, you just yes. answered that one. That's cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. Um, so now I want to open it up to all three of you and, and you can just sort of turn your camera on or start speaking. But the one question that um, people have asked across the board is, how does the community build aspect of your work in the past inform your current process? 
because I know all of you have worked with a team of people as you're doing these projects. So how has that affected what you do in the future, knowing that you'll have a, a community involved? Um, should we go for it? I, sure, yeah. I can say that um, working with a team uh, ha has made me a better artist be because uh, you want to see what people bring to the table. Everybody does something really well. So when they come to build Babel or, or a project, we, we ask, what do you want to do? What, what is your biggest dream? Because if people can really uh, submerge themselves into something they really want to do, they're bringing something that can blow my mind or Natalia's mind. And so yeah. that is just to me, the most incredible thing is watching people go and, and saying, yes, yes, yeah. go with that. You See know? what they bring. Yeah. And it's just going to be so exciting to work with people again. I mean, we've gotten to work with each other and we just we haven't had any bigger <laughs> i know <laughs> we've given it to each other um but yeah just being able to collaborate again with some fresh energy and ideas is so exciting so we're looking forward to that when it becomes possible yeah i know i missed that part right now what i really love about the zoom meetings though is that it's like burning man because you can not wear pants <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's making me feel, you know, welcomed at home. Great. <laughs> Just try to stand up. Sit down there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how about you, Ida or Usha? Any thoughts about what it's like um, working in community while you're building and how that impacts, uh, impacts your process? Uh, should I go? Sure. Uh, I think it's huge. Um, for me, the community all brings the specific skills to the table. So, for example, I have this uh, crazy idea that I want to make a 13 meter, 13 ton or 15 meter, 13 ton, half a peg out of steel, but I haven't thought about, will it actually stand? Does the structure hold? Uh, because I'm just dreaming. And so what's so great is like the engineer will say, hang on, but <laughs> this is gonna fall down. You need this, you need that. Uh, the, um, the architects have brought in a uh, very clear design. Let's try it like this, let's do it, which are things that I, I would never consider. And it's so, I feel so privileged to work with people who are so invested in my vision. That's great, yeah, I love that. It was fun in your video getting yeah. to see, you know, just a little bit of the cast of characters that are involved. Yeah, and they, <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and how about you, Ida, any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, Usha and Michael said it bo both really well that everyone does bring something to the table. And I think if you have a big dream, especially when it's a big project in a large scale, you need more than one or two person. And that's something I've definitely learned over the years with Space Cats is it's, it, takes, it takes a family to really build something beautiful. Yeah, I appreciated seeing your crew too. <laughs> it, it really helps to round things out. It's a nice thing to get to experience. Yeah. Uh, another question we've had come in from um, John Valentino that's for all of you is how do you choose the metaphors that you use in your artwork? So why a space cat? Uh, why a clothes peg? A couple other people said um, talk more about the clothes peg or Michael and Natalia, how do you decide what imagery to include in the totem? Where do those things come from? I mean, oh. uh, well, you know, for, for Babel, it, it's fortunate that we've been working on a new tarot deck of photos. So a photographic tarot deck. So this just seemed to fit perfectly into this, this piece uh, metaphorically. So um, that, that's going to cover a lot of, of Babel. Um, metaphors are funny. Sometimes you know exactly what you, the, the message that you're trying to make. And sometimes you just go with it. And all of a sudden you look at the piece you make and this big revelation of what you've just done comes to you. So it's just like some sort of visionary flood or you're actually going for it with a message. Um, it, it really just depends on how I feel when I wake up or how yeah. Natalia, what Natalia, we were having some I eggs. Mean, I tend to feel the message comes afterwards a lot of times after I create something. I don't always necessarily come with a message in mind. And then it's almost like it vocalizes or visualizes for me what's going on in my inner psyche sometimes some of these things which is fun to just see what the art will unfold yeah i've had that experience it's cool and you're like oh i guess i was thinking about that <laughs> or yeah <laughs> <laughs> time to go deeper there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. 
Oh, how about you, Ida or Usha? Metaphors? So with Space Cats, um, both years, the rocket had a quote engraved on it. They will not go quietly, the ones who shared our lives in subtle ways they let us know their spirit still survives. So that's always been the metaphor with Space Cats. And I didn't come up with this. This was actually written on the letter the vet gave me when they put my cat down. And that really stuck with me. So I brought that with Space Cats. And the metaphor works well with the project because the end when it said their spirit still survives, which is like what Space Cats is about, is what happens to cats when they become stardust. Um, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and touching. And what a nice <laughs> vet to have something so thoughtful and meaningful in their letter. That's, yeah, that's it, was, nice. it was really sweet. Yeah. Hmm. And Usha, you shared a little bit about um, working with objects that you think are gendered in the video, but do you want to talk a little bit more about where the clothes peg came from? Yeah, so in my work, I use a lot of domestic objects. Um, and, and the backstory to that also is that in South Africa, we have a largely uh, non-gallery going, non-museum going public. And in my work, I try always, although the work can be often quite conceptual, I try to have an access point for people who are not necessarily art literate uh, to, to engage with the work. In fact, I had an exhibition quite a few years ago where I asked like my neighbors and friends and friends' mothers to donate their disused uh, domestic objects. And I produced a, a, a museum touring solo exhibition uh, with all their, their stuff. And uh, at the opening, all these people came to, uh, to view the exhibition and they were looking for their particular broom or their iron and identifying their object within the show. And for me, that was just such a great access point into contemporary art where people who don't normally go to galleries can, can access work. Uh, so that's the broader thinking around it. Um, yeah. That's neat. Yeah, I really like seeing in the video, you know, bits of all the irons and all your clothes pegs and yeah, it was, it's fun to get to see. Have yeah, see also I've been clothes. working with the, with the clothes peg a lot and I've been working with it in multiple. Um, so yeah, the ones where you had them all them, lined up. Yeah, that was super cool. Correct, so when you put them together and I've been playing with making them quite uh, malleable and flexible so that I can sculpt with them. Uh, so when this opportunity came up, I thought what happens if you, if you grow it? <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. You know, I got one out ahead of time. I was looking oh. at it. I was like, how does she do it? And how, I, I would not have thought of separating it into one half and making it take away the function. So I just have part of the form. And yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> thing to you look, you look at something more closely when you start to take it out of its regular context, I think. Correct. And blow it up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is a really good thing to do in Black Rock City where there's, you know, it's kind of the sky's the limit in terms of how big things can be. And uh, or maybe the container, honestly, is the limit for how big it can be. Yes. <laughs> uh, but it's yeah. fun to, to play around with scale like that. Sure. Um, okay. And so just um, one more question for all of you, whoever feels like answering of the artists. Uh, Camilla wants to know, how do you keep yourselves inspired? Do you have any tips? Uh, I, I say it's like this. Every morning you have to wake up and it's like exercise, you know, I mean, you don't want to go exercise, but you know, you sometimes you need to. And, you know, sometimes you make something good and sometimes you make something bad, but you make something. Keep and making. Keep making. <laughs> and in that, in that process of, of this exercise we call art, sometimes something comes up, inspiration. And that just, and then that can carry you on through a whole project just that pushing in the morning to do it every single day in one way or the other, whatever it is, you know. True, but I'm with you, Ida, in your video, you were talking about having a break from it too. I think it's good to sometimes step away from the art, like for me, in watching and taking care of Poppy as she's grown up a lot more in this last year. It's like, I feel like it's all kind of like building inside of me. My creativity is kind of going a different way. But when I do step out and actually make something that is art, I'm just like, wow, it's still there. Okay, good. Like, I don't think anybody is ever gonna lose it. It's just like, everybody has their process, you know? But I've, as far as getting inspired, seeing other artists, like both of Usha and Ida, I'm so excited to see your work and just seeing other artists work is honestly very inspirational because it almost makes, 
we a lot of times be like, oh, I want to try something with that or like that. And just, it just sparks ideas too. Mm. Totally. Yeah, that's cool. And I'm with you on the pause, you know, taking a break. It's often, you know, in a, in a walk or a shower or something where the good ideas come to you. I think it's important to let your mind have that space to uh, do its thing. Exactly. Yeah. I think as artists, we also just naturally more attentive. We observe uh, more with brighter colors maybe, or we, we hear you know, with bigger ears. Just, I think naturally we're more intuitive and more attentive. And so we tend to translate that into something that's more tangible. Yeah, agreed. I like that. I, bigger eyes, bigger ears. <laughs> that's cool. The way I try to keep myself inspired um, is when I get frustrated with a project, I like to leave the house. I'll go for a walk or I'll, I don't know, go, go somewhere else, anywhere, somewhere new, um, and just observe the scenery around me, whether it's an art gallery or in nature or at a friend's house. Um, to just do something a little mindless so my brain can just turn off. Um, I find that healthy. It's good, you, it's good to give yourself breaks. Um, and also go online, research, Google other artists. So many people are doing so many cool things out there. If you spend like hours looking at it, you'll find yourself getting up and working on a project. You're inspired by everyone else. <laughs> cool. I mean, certainly what all four of you are doing is working because the stuff you guys are coming up with is really just uh, phenomenal. And I think we're all really excited even more so about the next time we're able to come together in person in Black Rock City. So um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up here. Uh, it's been such a treat to talk to all the three of you, uh, the four of you. And I just really want to thank you guys, the artists, for being the first ever artists to be on Art Speaks with us. Um, I want to thank John Valentino and Sarah Fisk, who brought this to life on Playa the last number of years. And I especially want to thank um, all of you in the audience here. A big, sincere, huge thank you for supporting the artists, for giving us your time, for listening to these stories, for helping these creative visions take flight. Uh, I know that many of you are also artists and creative beings in your own right. So thank you for being inspirations in your own community. And this is just the beginning, right? It's a series. So super exciting. Our next one is going to be on Wednesday, July 22nd, um, again at noon, which we're trying out so that we can get a, a larger international audience. We may try an after work one occasionally here or there. Um, but the next one, the theme is sustainability. So we're going to be talking with three different honorary artists who are working with upcycled and recycled materials. So that's um, sure to be an interesting one. And we're going to put the registration link in the chat um, for next time if it's not already in there. Yeah, I think it, I see it coming. Um, and lastly, on the theme of sustainability, I wanted to share that my good friend and colleague, DA, who is the head of Playa Restoration, which if any of you are new to Burning Man, that's the team of folks that come through after the event is over and make sure that the land is completely to, in better shape than it was when, before we got there. Um, he's doing right now a fundraiser called a Moopathon, where he's picking up any trash or matter out of place. He's walking 85 miles from Wadsworth, Nevada to the Black Rock Desert. And he's hoping to raise $80,000, so a dollar for every participant of Burning Man, and using that funding to go towards our sustainability initiatives. So um, we'll put a link to that in the chat too, if you're able to contribute. Um, and also Burning Man Project is a nonprofit. The, the work that our team does year round to support these artists is part of the larger mission of Burning Man Project. And so if you feel moved to support us, we really would appreciate that as well. Um, help us to continue our work, keep the series going, and bring Black Rock City back in all of its glory. So that's uh, donate.burningman.org. And just a huge thanks to you for joining. It was super fun to have this first one. I'm excited to keep going with it. And have a great day. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Let's Thanks. roll the credits. Uh, Bye. That was awesome. <laughs>